um, at the Lord's Prayer. And uh, this week, we're looking at Thy will be done. So remember the first time it was we talked about the words Our Father. In the English, it's Our Father who is in heaven. And in the Hebrew, it was Our Father in heaven. In English, it was Hallowed be your name. And in the Hebrew Matthew, it was May your name be sanctified. In English, it was Your kingdom come. And in the Hebrew Matthew, it was May your kingdom be blessed. Today, in the English, it's your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in the Hebrew Matthew version, it says, Your will shall be done in heaven and on earth. So we can see there's a little bit of difference there. Now one thing I've often suggested was that it's difficult for us to pray, Thy will be done in complete honesty as we continue to make our decisions based on our own personal desires and on our own will. So as we pray to God, Typically, we're praying for the things we want, for the things we desire, for what we want to be done, for what we want to happen. And then it's tough to say, oh, thy will be done, you know, when we're thinking about our own will. So we have this uh, English versus Hebrew translation here. And this, again, is from the book, A Prayer to Our Father. And it's, it's basically the Lord's Prayer from the Hebrew Matthew version. And remember, it was... And an a African-American pastor named Keith Johnson who got together with, with a, a Jewish scholar named Nehemiah Gordon. And they tried to look at the Hebrew origins of the Lord's Prayer. And that's kind of what we're going through now. <clears throat> so we want to notice that in the English version, it sounds a little bit more like a request or a desire. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As if God's will isn't being done on earth, that we want him to perform his will on earth just as he does in heaven. <clears throat> now, to think about God in, in those separate areas, in earth or on heaven, kind of takes away our thought of a sovereign God that's over all things and in control of all things. <clears throat> so we really shouldn't be separating it in our mind, that his will is going to be done regardless of whether it's on earth or in heaven. <clears throat> So the, the Hebrew way sounds a little bit more like an exclamation or a proclamation than what it sounds like a desire in the English. <clears throat> in the English, it sounds as if we're pleading for God's will to be done on earth. I'll scratch your throat. Hang on one second here. <clears throat> so we got to ask ourselves, is this really a request or a statement that needs to be made? The fact of the matter is, is that God's will is going to be done regardless of where it is or whether we're part of it or whether we want to fight against it. God's will is going to be done. If God is truly all-powerful, if God is really all-knowledgeable and ever-present, then, then it is only His will that matters. His is the only will that matters in the overall scheme of things. Our part is to align ourselves with His will so that we can be part of it, and we align ourselves with his will through our obedience to what he calls us to do. So basically, the, the Matthew version is a statement of fact, your will shall be done on earth and in heaven, or in heaven and on earth. It's just stating factually, your will will be done. It shall be done. It's a declaration that leaves no room for doubt, and therefore no room for pleading. It's, it's the sovereignty of God. So what we need to do is we need to have this paradigm shift in our thinking. And it's moving from this requesting of his will to be done, something from God. We need to, to shift that to being something that glorifies God and his majestic power. Leaves no doubt about sovereignty of God. There, there's no room for doubt there. God is sovereign. He's over all things. His will shall be done, whether it be in heaven or on earth. He is in control and in charge of all things. Um, when Jesus went to the garden to pray, here's one good example of a prayer from Jesus, one of his actual prayers. He went to the garden to pray the, the day before he went to, to be judged and crucified. And in chapter 26 of Matthew it says, And he went a little beyond them, being the disciples that were with him in the garden. He went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So the first part of the prayer is a lot like what we pray. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. 
But most of the time, we'll continue on in our prayers seeking for that to happen and looking for ways for that to happen, even explaining to God possibilities for that to happen. But Jesus right away says, but not as I will, but as you will. See, Jesus is in harmony with the Father. He knows what's expected. And in his anguish, in his humanity, he's saying, hey, Father, if there's another way possible, can we look at that? But he's in full submission to God as he immediately says, but hey, don't go by what I want. Let's do what your will is. Let's accomplish the will that you sent me here to accomplish. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah is a, a one example of how it was learned the hard way about God's will being done, that the will of God would be done. In Genesis chapter 19, we read, The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. So a little side note in this story, I've heard different explanations by many people about why this judgment on these cities came. And frankly, many of them come from the agenda of the party presenting it. So depending on what their point of view is, they might say, well, it was for this reason or that reason. Well, let's just stick to the facts of why God did this. And in chapter 18 of Genesis, it says, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. So we see here right here that, that the Lord said, that their sin is exceedingly great. It was their sin that brought this judgment. The sin of the people of those cities offended God, and he chose to pass judgment upon them, upon those cities. His will would be done in one form or another. It was gonna be done through their obedience, or he would bring judgment, and that sin would not continue. So let's not be so foolish to think that, that our cities or our nation is immune from the judgment of God. Our sin is also great before the eyes of God. And we see here in Genesis 19:24 that when God saw that their sin was great and they were not repenting from it, it says, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So could, the, could God have done this exactly as it's written? Could there have been some supernatural production of brimstone and fire in the heavens that he cast down upon the earth? You know, if we believe that God is all-powerful and that he created all things, certainly he could have created this brimstone and fire. And if he's in all, all, control of all things and everything's held together by the power of his word, he could have actually brought judgment in that way. He also could do it in any way or form that he wants to. He could have done it with a natural disaster. It's equally plausible to know that God, with his unlimited knowledge, he's not limited by space and time, with the, with knowing how everything works, he could have even caused the natural disaster to happen. And it's very possible that he used his own creation to pass judgment on these people that were rebelling against him. You see, this area where Sodom and Gomorrah and these other two cities were these four cities of the plain, they're called, they're sitting next to the Dead Sea. And where the Dead Sea is situated, there's some hot springs, and it's sulfur that rises up out of the earth and heats this area, and they have these hot springs. And the sulfur is oozing out between these tectonic plates. There's two plates that come together in the Earth's crust, and the sulfur eases up between these two plates. So there's a theory that there were many eruptions here at that time, and it cast all the sulfur and brimstone and fire up into the air, much as a volcanic eruption would be. So the theory says that all this stuff was spewing up into the air, and then these hot flaming projectiles came down and obliterated these cities. So which is harder to believe, that, that this eruption could happen, casting up all this stuff in the air and coming down upon the people at a time that God has told it to? Or that God created this fire and brimstone in the heavens and had it hurled at the earth? I mean, either way is plausible in my mind. It's, it's easier for me to believe that he used his own creation and, and caused this uprising, this eruption, if you will, that rained down this fire and brimstone upon the earth. But it could have happened either way. So if, if we want to say to ourselves, oh, I can't believe that, that that could have happened, or I can't believe that that God would do that, or I can't believe that he passes judgment like that, 
if we're using our own limited knowledge and our limited understanding to determine what God would or would not do, we're kind of uh, pressing our luck there. Because God is telling us in his own word that he in fact did do it. And he tells us that he did it as judgment upon their sin. So who is to say that judgment will or will not be passed upon our own country, our own nation, for the sins that come up before God? You know, we can look at just a few things in our own United States here of how we defy God with our ideas and our attitudes. Pornography, for example, is a $24.9 billion industry. So at the cost of $3,000 per second, it's bigger than our idolization of football, baseball, and basketball all combined. So we think that we, uh, we idolize our sports heroes. This pornography is even bigger than that. And we look at it as being freedom of speech, that we're free to express whatever we want, all the while it's destroying minds and families. It's a sin against God. How about 50 million innocent lives being murdered in abortion? But we look at it as a legal right to choose. We throw it back in God's face saying we have the legal right to choose whether or not we want to, to have this abortion. Or how about a recent survey that shows that uh, the U.S. is 11th out of 53 countries in church attendance. One survey shows it to be 44%. One survey shows it to actually be rising to 43.1%. But either way, that's less than 50% of adults in this country that take the time to go to church to worship God. We're throwing it back in his face. We don't need to worship you. We don't need to take time. We don't need to put you first. So what is our view? You know, how do we look at these disasters and these tragedies? We blame things that happen on nature or the fact that we live in a fallen world. And we say that a fallen world is the reason that all these things happen. We look at ter terrorism, for example, just simply as an evil in the world that needs to be fought against. We insist upon looking for logical explanations for everything and think that it is somehow illogical for God to pass judgment in our day as though his sovereignty is somehow limited. We say, well, we're under the age of grace. God isn't a judging God right now. We're under grace. Well, that's true. Individually, we're under the grace of God if we're believers and if we're following him. He still raises up and lowers nations. He still passes judgment on, on sin in the world. And he does it in a manner to cause people to come to repentance. He always brings warnings first of judgment before the judgment happens so that the people can have a chance to repent and cry out to him. So while many of these other reasons may be true for these events happening, the fallen world, it's just nature, it's the way things are, it's not unreasonable to think that God perhaps hates our sin enough that he is judging it and he is calling upon us to repent and come back to him. So as Sodom and Gomorrah learn, God's will shall be done. Can we continue to ask for God's protection and safekeeping, but, keep, but deny that he will have the ability to pass judgment? We like the positive stuff. We don't like the stuff that hurts. We want to claim the promises, but some of them have conditions, and if we don't fulfill those conditions, are we also going to take the curses that go with it? See, we always like the positive, but we don't want the negative. So our thinking has to change in a way to match what God is thinking. Our thinking that he can do some things and won't do others needs to change. So we need to understand that any means are at his disposal to see that his will is accomplished. See, he has all this prophecy about how things are going to transpire in the last days. He's going to see that it comes to pass. It is his will that things happen in a certain way. He raises up kings and he lays low kingdoms. He determines the times and the seasons for the things of this world. Who are we to say that he can or can't accomplish his will in whatever form he decides to? So we need to pray like David did. In Psalm 145, 143, David prayed, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. See, David had a will of his own, but like Jesus, David before him is looking to know the will of God. Teach me to do your will. This is the prayer of a humble man seeking communion with God. Are we seeking to be in communion with God and to do his will? And then another example from Jesus himself in the Gospel of Matthew, it says, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So it's one thing to, to say, I'm a follower of Christ. It's one thing to say, I trust and believe in Jesus Christ. It's another to live it out, to do the will of the Father, to do as David did and seek God, saying, teach me your will that I can do it because you are my God. Are we just saying, Lord, Lord, or are we actually doing the will of the Father? And then again in Matthew chapter 12, somebody came to Jesus and says, someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are out standing outside seeking to speak to you. Just another side note, those who say that uh, Mary never gave birth, never had children with Joseph, here it says right here, your mother and your brothers are standing outside speak, seeking to speak to you. And this isn't the only place it says that in the Bible. It says, but Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand before toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So again, the point here is that he's saying those who are doing the will of my Father are truly the ones who are following me, who have given the ability to become children of God, joint heirs with me in the glories of heaven. So... The will of God is the important part of the scripture that we're to look at, and we're to search it out. Do we want to be adopted into the family of God? It is in doing the will of the Father that it is seen that we have truly devoted ourselves to following Christ. So that brings up the question, how do we know what God's will is? And as always, the same answer. It's in studying the word, being in scripture, studying the Bible, and in prayer. God gave us scriptures so we could know all that he would want us to know about himself and about having faith and about trusting in him. So let's look at a few examples from Jesus and Paul and what it says in scripture here. In chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, it says, and this is Jesus speaking, and look at the first four words here. This is the will. So it's telling us directly here what the will of God is. This is the will of him who sent me, that, all, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So it's the will of God that if we're following Christ, if we're seeking to be close to him, and we're seeking to do what he would have us to do, it is the will of God that we would be raised up with Christ on the last day. First Thessalonians, Paul writes, For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So Paul says that it's the will of God that we be sanctified. And if you remember our study in Romans, sanctification is that setting apart unto God is being made holy as he is holy. Sanctification is God working out that actual righteousness in the believer. Remember at our time of salvation, we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ covering us. In sanctification, we're becoming holier, we're becoming more spiritually mature, and God works out that actual righteousness in our lives. Again, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So again, the will of God is that we act in thanksgiving, and that we pray without ceasing. That we're always in communion with the Spirit. We're always in communion with God through our prayers and through the awareness in our minds that, that He is present with us. So being in constant communion and in a spirit of thanksgiving, that is the will of God. <clears throat> In chapter 12, verse 2 of Romans, Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we see in Romans 12, 2, that it's our mindset that needs to change, that we need to be transforming our thoughts to agree with that which God says, get away from our own selfish desires, and get on with what God would have us to do. 
get away from our own selfish thoughts and get on to thinking about things the way God wants us to think about them. And this change only comes through the study of Scripture and being in prayer. So we oftentimes confuse what we believe with what we know. We will believe some things without really knowing the facts. Rumors and gossip spread like wildfire because we believe something to be true that we've heard without knowing the truth and without first searching out the facts. How often do we reject the truth because it doesn't conform to what we believe? I have a certain belief, somebody comes and shares the truth with me and I reject it because I want to hang on to what I believe, rather than searching out and seeing if what was presented to me is the truth. So again, to go back to that example, I grew up in a religion that believed that, that Mary was a virgin at birth, which is true, but then it also taught that Mary remained a virgin throughout her life. Well, there's, there's more than one spot, and I showed you one, where it talks about Jesus' mother and his brothers. There's also a spot that talks about brothers and sisters. And they have to go and circumvent this scripture by giving other explanations for things the way that it really isn't. You know, are, are we going to hang on to that belief because it's what we were taught? Or when we're presented with truth from scripture, are we going to receive that and change our beliefs and our opinions to match the word of God? That is doing the will of God, to come into agreement with him. So we can't be so quick to reject God's judgment because we think that God is just a God of love and we're under grace and there's no judgment in the world. You know, do we want to hang on to that belief or do we want to agree with what God says? That there is judgment. He does come against sin. He doesn't allow sin to go on forever without punishment. He brings us warnings. He brings us opportunities to repent. His grace provides for that opportunity of salvation. But if we hang on to that sinfulness and refuse to accept the gospel message for salvation, if we refuse to accept the teaching of changing our behavior to do what is right, judgment does eventually come. So we need to examine ourselves and see if we are truly following the right God. We are called by our Creator to worship Him as He is, not as we want Him to be. We must ask ourselves, did God create me? Or am I creating a God in my own image? Am I creating a God the way I want Him to be? If we are to pray His will be done, we need to know what His will is. We need to transform our ways of thinking to match His ways so that we can understand what it is that He wants. So we have to examine ourselves. Am I dependent upon God for all things? Or is my God limited by what I believe? Am I going to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and serve Him? Or is my God supposed to serve me? Am I really praying, Thy will be done? Or am I praying, Do my will? So God calls us to repentance, to turn away from the sin that defies His holiness. He calls us to humble ourselves before Him. He calls us to live in obedience to Him. He calls us to be thankful and to worship and adore Him. In our sin, we are separated from God. In the sacrifice of the cross, Jesus shedding His blood for the redemption of sins, for our forgiveness, He restores that relationship with God for those who will believe. So if you have not yet believed and accepted that sacrifice as the forgiveness of your sins, you need to consider what Scripture says, that Christ went to the cross to pay a debt that he did not pay. He went to the cross to pay our debt that we could not pay. He didn't owe this debt. We do. We can't pay it. He went and paid it for us. So if you have not yet considered that, you need to humble yourself and seek God and ask him to show you the truth, to cry out to him for his saving grace and the truth of the gospel. He will hear that prayer and he will lead you to the ways of life everlasting. But what it comes down to is is are we praying, thy will be done, and then are we doing it? To simply pray, thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth, on earth as it is in heaven, or even praying, thy will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven, you know, whichever way you want to pray it, the same thing comes into effect. His will will be done. His will shall be done on earth. His will shall be done in heaven. Are we on board with it? Are we aligning our thoughts and our beliefs to match His 
so that we're on his side, so that we can truly be adopted into the family of God. So as we pray, we can ask God for whatever we want. But like Christ did in that garden, we need to be submitted. This is what I see, Lord. This is what I would like. This is a struggle I would like to be delivered from. But not my will, yours be done. Your will is higher than mine. Your will is more important than mine. Your will be done. I am the servant. You are the Lord. You are the master. I am the slave. I am here to carry out your will. So this, this, Hebrew, this Hebrew Matthew version is quite accurate. His will shall be done in heaven and on earth whether we're on board or not. So let's get on board, receive that gift of salvation, be adopted into the family of God, as brothers and sisters, and then worship Him in spirit and in truth. So let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank You for the opportunity to look into Your Word. We thank You that in the Bible You give us all that we need to know, all that we need to know about You, all that we need to know about how you would have us to behave. All that we need to know about how you would have us worship you. And the knowledge that you have given in your mercy and your grace, this opportunity for us to be redeemed, for us to be delivered from the penalty of our sin by the work of Jesus Christ done on the cross, by the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for that as we go into this Christmas season and celebrate the birth of Christ, that our Savior came into the world with this opportunity for us to receive such a free gift of salvation that only you could provide. So help us to think on these things as we go through this Christmas season, to believe in you, to rejoice in you, and to give thanks unceasingly for your great gift. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.